developed uh, emerging uh, technologies uh, that are applied to, to treat patients with neurologic and psychiatric conditions. Um, despite all our advances, uh, and despite all the medications, uh, there are, are millions of patients uh, with uh, neurological and psychiatric conditions that are still suffering. Uh, and there's hope for these patients in that uh, there is advances in brain imaging, and understanding where in the brain these problems arise, and also the possibility of intervening uh, within these circuits in the brain that are dysfunctional. It's quite clear now that every uh, part of human behavior, every part, everything that we do, every movement, uh, whether it's sensory function, motor function, uh, thoughts, memory, moods, uh, these are all controlled by neural elements, by neural circuits. And it is when there is abnormalities, dysfunction in these circuits that we start to see the signs and symptoms of neurologic and psychiatric disease. So by way of example, uh, we have circuits that control movement and when the activity in these circuits goes awry, we get problems like Parkinson's disease and tremor. There are also circuits that control your mood and where there's dysfunction in these circuits, you can get severe depression, for example. There can also be circuits that control pain. When these circuits have malfunction, you can have spontaneous pain states, you can have phantom limb pain, you can have chronic pain states. There's also problems in circuits that control your memory and cognitive function. And a good example of dysfunction within these circuits uh, leads to the disturbance that we know as Alzheimer's disease. And then there's some conditions, for example, epilepsy, where there's dysfunction across multiple circuits and a dysfunction in one circuit that spreads like wildfire from one circuit to another and causes widespread dysfunction throughout the whole brain. And that is what we know as, as generalized epilepsy. So what I'm going to tell you about today is the possibility of intervening within these various circuits in patients who have tried everything and are still disabled, in patients who, despite all available therapies, all available medications are still disabled by their problems. And I'm going to focus on three problems. I'm going to focus on the problem of Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to focus on the problem of epilepsy. And I'm going to focus on the problem of tremor. So the first problem I'm going to tell you about is the possibility of using pacemakers to regulate the activity of the brain, to turn up the activity of the brain very much like you would increase the volume on your radio. So what I'm showing you here is a PET scan of the brain, uh, and it shows how much glucose the brain is using, and red is a high level, and blue would be a low level. And in a normal person, you expect the brain to use a high level of glucose. In fact, the brain uses about 25% of the entire glucose in your body, even though it only weighs 2%. As you go towards a state called mild cognitive impairment, which is a precursor of Alzheimer's disease, there's a progressive drop in glucose utilization. In fact, there are huge areas of the brain that get turned down, that get shut off. And the issue is, we don't know exactly why this occurs, but is this something that is permanent? Is this something that is reversible? So we wondered whether one can feed these areas with electrical stimulation and see if we could turn them back on and would this result in a return of function in our patients. So the strategy we chose was, was to uh, stimulate within these, this memory circuit of the brain. This is called PAPE circuit. And we introduced electrodes in this area of the brain called the fornix to see if we could stimulate here and then activate this entire circuit of the brain to see whether we could restore glucose utilization in these neurons and whether they could come back to life. So this is done using a technique called deep brain stimulation, which involves uh, the patients who are awake for these operations. We freeze the skin, and through the skin we make two small drill holes and place these, uh, these wires uh, into the brain. And in fact, we can put these wires anywhere we want in the brain, so we can stimulate any circuit in the brain that we want. We can turn any circuit up or down. We can turn any area of your brain up or down. We can increase it or decrease it. And we can program this externally so that with a remote control, very much like the remote for your television, you can turn to one station or the other, or you can turn the volume up or down. So we can do this also. We can place these electrodes anywhere in the brain, and we can turn any circuit of the brain on or off, up or down. So we've had the idea to put this in the circuits in the brain that control your cognitive function and your memory 
to see whether we could turn them up and whether this would produce any benefits with respect to cognitive function. And this is what we found. This is our first six patients. These are the first six patients in the world with Alzheimer's disease who've had electrodes implanted to drive these circuits. And indeed, at the beginning, before the operation, uh, these areas in blue, shown here, are the areas in the brain that were shut down. The areas in blue are using less glucose than normal. So there are areas of the brain that are progressively being shut down. As your Alzheimer's gets worse and worse, these areas get bigger and bigger. So there's a progressive blackout, if you like, that spreads throughout the brain. So the lights are out in these areas of the brain in patients with Alzheimer's. We then placed electrodes in uh, these circuits. We turned them on. This is shown after one month and after one year. And the areas in red are the areas that have seen an increase in glucose utilization in the brain. So indeed, after one month or after one year, we are able to reverse this process to some extent. We're able to get these areas of the brain that were shut down to once again use glucose. So the message here is that in Alzheimer's disease, the lights are out, but in fact there is someone home, and using electrical stimulation within these circuits, we're able to coax these neurons in these areas of the brain to once again use glucose. And with that, we anticipate that the functions that these areas of the brain subserve will come back online. On the basis of these results, we are now in a phase two clinical trial. This first six patients was a phase one. We are now up to 25 patients and we are comparing uh, the results of patients that receive stimulation to those that do not. And we will see whether this is safe and effective and could be used to treat patients with Alzheimer's. This is an important problem. There are more than five million people with Alzheimer's in North America, and so far most treatments are ineffective. So it's important to look outside the box and look for other ways of seeing if we can enhance brain function uh, in these patients. So this then is an example of using a pacemaker to regulate the activity of brain circuits, in this case a cognitive circuit in Alzheimer's disease. Could we also use pacemakers or other forms of electrical stimulation to regulate the activity of brain circuits? And the example I'm going to give you now is using electricity as a defibrillator. You all know that when the heart uh, beats in a very erratic fashion, instead of having a contraction of the heart in, a, in, a, in one smooth stop a step and getting cardiac output, you don't get any cardiac output, you become unconscious, and that's because the, there's disrupted electrical activity. Well, the same can happen in the brain, and when that happens in the brain, it's called an epileptic seizure, producing a convulsion. So here is an electroencephalogram, which measures the electrical activity of the brain, and this is someone who has these electroencephalogram leads and who goes on to have a generalized seizure, and you can see what happens when the seizure, which initially starts over here and then spreads and, and soon the entire brain is involved in an electrographic convulsion. This person is losing consciousness and is convulsing during this period in time. So these are patients who, despite all medications and so on, are still seizing. These are very ill patients. What is often the case in patients with epilepsy is that before the onset of a generalized convulsion, several seconds before, there is a warning. There is a harbinger that indeed you're going to get a seizure. So in this case, it's one, two, three, four, five, six seconds before you know this person is going to get a seizure because you get the spike and wave that occurs before the generalized convulsion. What if you could have a preemptive strike? What if you could abort the onset of the seizure? So this is exactly what we intend to do. And so there, it's possible to detect these events online and to stimulate the brain here to see if you can indeed stop this abnormal, abnormality in electrical activity and see if you can avert the onset and the generalization of an epileptic seizure. So the idea here is to detect these abnormalities and to then be able to stimulate to see if you can reset, reboot uh, the brain rhythm. And this is done with a company called Neuropace, and this is what this implant looks like. This goes into the skull. These are electrode wires that go into the brain. They sense the electrical activity of the brain, and when there's a seizure activity, the premonition of the seizure that's about to start, this stimulator kicks in in an attempt to try to abort the epileptic seizure. And it looks something like this. These uh, devices are implanted in the skull like this. These are the sensors or the stimulators. You can sense or stimulate from any of these things. Here, for example, the sensor is detecting online an epileptic activity. You deliver a therapy, then you resample. In this case, you resample and it's back to normal. Here, on the other hand, you detect an epileptic activity. 
you stimulate, you redetect, it's still epileptiform, which tells the stimulator to kick on in once again to provide another round of therapy and so on, still epileptiform, another round of therapy and so on until finally it becomes non-epileptic. So this is now being used in experimental trials. There have been over 200 patients that have received this type of therapy so far. This is an example of a closed loop system where the stimulation is not on all the time, but rather is only on on a contingency basis when you detect a seizure coming on and then it kicks in and delivers the electrical activity in an, eff an effort to try to abort the onset of a seizure. So that's an example of a closed loop system to defibrillate, if you like, a seizure to prevent a seizure from occurring. The next thing I'm going to tell you about is the latest thing that we're working on, and it's something that is totally non-invasive. It does not involve any incision. So this is brain surgery without any knives. And we're able to actually focus sound waves through the skull and ablate little areas of the brain. And let me tell you a little bit. We're using this to treat patients with tremor. So if you look at someone who has a tremor, and you look at their thalamus, this is the behavior of the neurons in their, th in their thalamus with tremor. So you see that these neurons are firing in synchrony. They're firing all together in a monotonous five per second uh, rhythm. And every time that this neuron is firing, you get a beat of, of tremor. The normal firing of these neurons should be a very random way. But in patients with tremor, these neurons are firing in these clusters. And when they f go from this normal state to this clustered firing like this, then you get a beat of tremor. Every time this neuron is firing, you get a beat of tremor. So our job is to seek out these troublemakers in the thalamus. There's about 25,000 of them causing tremor in your hand. To seek them out and tell them, gentlemen, it's time to stop that nonsense. We want you to stop firing in this way. We want you to go back to fire in this way or not fire at all. So what we decided to do is to use sound waves through the skull to focus the sound waves on these cells that are firing like this. And basically, we we're just simply taking them out. We we're simply destroying them using sound waves. So it looks something like this. We are focusing uh, 1,024 beams of ultrasound through the skull uh, and focusing them on one spot. This is very much like uh, taking a magnifying glass on a summer day and making a hole in a piece of paper. Right? So we're able to focus all these beams through the skull, no incisions, and we do this in the MRI, so we're able to aim this very precisely using MR guidance. This is what it looks like uh, in real case. So this is our, our first patient that was uh, put in this machine. This work is being done with a brilliant scientist at Sunnybrook called Kalerbo Heinonen. And the patients go into this. They're completely awake. And they go into this machine, and we're able to focus these beams. This looks like one of those old-fashioned hair dryers. And you're able to focus all these beams onto this one spot, a one or two millimeter spot in the skull, and focus these beams to uh, heat the tissue with ultrasound, and in so doing, destroy the tissue. So this is what it looks like where we are able to make these lesions in the thalamus. And here you see this area that we've aimed at and made a lesion. This is what it looks like on day one. And here it is on day seven and so on on day 30. And after about three months, we can barely see the lesion at all. So what does this look like? So here's our patient number three. So here he is before the treatment. He has tremor. As you can see, he has essential tremor, very disabled. He's had this for about 20 years. He's not able to write, he's not able to drink, not able to eat, has trouble dressing. He's trying to pick up a cup here. He can't even pick up the cup because of a severe tremor. He's trying to sign his name here to see how much difficulty he has. So this is him the morning of the procedure, uh, a few minutes before he goes into the machine. Here he is after he comes out of the machine. After several hours, Tony is brought out for his post-procedure assessment. And here he is. Where the effect is crystal clear. When's the last time you could do that? More than 10 years ago. So he hadn't been able to drink a glass. Uh. So he hadn't been able to drink a glass of water for 10 years. Uh, and so a very striking uh, treatment for him. This is his spiral. So. After the treatment, he's able to draw a spiral. Before, I think you saw, he was unable to put the pen uh, to the paper. So tremendous. So we've now operated on six patients like this. We've just uh, published this work last month. And uh, there's about a 90% improvement in the tremor 
in the contralateral hand, I envisage that uh, this will become an outpatient procedure, that patients will come into the hospital, have their treatment, and go home in time for lunch. And for the first time, they'll be able to actually eat their lunch and drink uh, their water uh, uh, with this kind. So I think that this kind of therapy has the advantage of being non-invasive. It does not involve any incisions uh, in the skull. It, it involves going into the MRI machine and into this uh, hair dryer type device that, that uh, focuses these beams. We're able to measure the temperature with MRI, so we're able to pre very precisely aim, and this is really uh, the main advantage of this is that we can very precisely aim where this is. The patient's awake, so if there's any side effects or any untoward effects, they can tell us immediately. And we can actually keep on making the lesion, making it bigger until the tremor goes away. So I think that this will become a very important future use of this therapy, and I envisage that we'll use it not only to treat things like tremor, but things like pain. We may be also be able to annihilate brain tumors in the brain without having to open the, the skull, for example. We might be able to open the blood-brain barrier and deliver antibodies or deliver molecules into the brain using this ultrasound technique. So I think that this is just the beginning of this type of technology. So in summary, uh, what I've told you today is that uh, there are several brain circuits uh, that uh, we can reach. In fact, I think that uh, all areas of the brain are now reachable. We know more about uh, how these circuits go uh, awry and how the dysfunction of these circuits cause uh, problems. In some cases, I've shown you a cognitive circuit uh, like in Alzheimer's disease, which is simply underperforming where there's a power uh, outage and we may be able to turn the lights back on. In other uh, cases, we've shown you circuits that are going really quite uh, uh, with abnormal activity in the case of epilepsy and spreading throughout the brain. And in other cases, there are neurons that are firing in an abnormal way, causing tremor, and we can seek these out, and we can stop them from doing that. So we know much more about the anatomy and physiology and where these troublemaking neurons exist in the brain. One of the most exciting things about this research and one of the advantages of being at a great university like the University of Toronto is that th we are surrounded by great scientists. And this is really multidisciplinary work. So we work with scientists in multiple domains, in engineering, uh, in physics, in biology, uh, in medicine, in molecular biology. And really being in a university is uh, really exciting because the great progress in our fields occur at the interface between the various disciplines when people with different skill sets and various disciplines come together uh, with a common vision to solve an important problem. And that's really one of the greatest advantages of working in the university uh, environment. So I envisage that with time, uh, these treatments that we do in neurosurgery in general will become safer, uh, less invasive. The patients, most procedures will be outpatient procedures. We will no longer have to open the head to uh, deliver our therapies. And this means that we can now offer these treatments to many more patients and that we be, might be able to treat patients that so far have run out of options. And so I think that ultimately we will be able to help many more patients with neurologic and psychiatric disease. And I thank you for your attention.